the hardcore MAGA right just wants to be entertained. They don't want to be challenged. They want to be told that what they're thinking is right and that the way they see the world is right and everything's terrible. Listen, nothing fuels the clicks like rage. Hello and welcome to the Bulwark's Next Level Sunday show. I'm your host, Tim Miller, and I'm here today with Bulwark fan, um, and uh, you know that's the most important part of his bio. Uh, but uh, also, New York Times bestselling author, twenty-two books, most recently Dead Fall, uh, which was on the bestseller list. I've only had one book on the bestseller list. We're not going to do a we're not going to do a comparing <laughs> uh, comparing contrast on the on that. Um, the Scott Harvest series, uh, the man, uh, the myth, the legend, Brad Thor, who's coming at us from Paris for this interview. I've been wanting to do this for a while. Thank you, Brad, for coming to hang out. Oh, it's it's my pleasure. I got uh, I got delayed coming in, so I came uh, right in from the airport, right into the apartment, and set up to do this with you. So this is fun. Perfect. Uh, so you can go get a good meal out in Paris after this is over. You'll earn it. Um, gay per- Wait, can we even say gay Paris? Or we, we can cancel in Florida. We can say this gay Paris on this show. podcast for sure. I don't I, I don't know about everywhere, but on this podcast is good. That that is a nice transition to a point that I was going to make. I just I just want to come clean on this, Brad. I I'm not a thriller reader, and I think it might be the gay thing. You know, I, I don't know. You, you're, you're the one who has book signings. I don't know if it, if it stereotypically feels like a lot of gays are showing up to your book signings, but I'm going to suspect no. Uh, you don't have to answer that if you don't want. Uh, so I, that's what I'm going to blame it on. Uh, my experience with you was twofold. Um, I, I feel like I've known you as a Twitter personality, kind of a mm-hmm. conservative commentator Twitter personality. Um, I'm just, just for any, any liberals who are going to get worried about this. He did. He, he is good. He's an ever-Trumper, so, so, you know, you can call him down. Um, so I was, I had experience of you as a, as a conservative Twitter personality. And then I had experience of you as a, you know, when I would Airbnb at the beach, I would see your, yeah. I'd see Brad Thor books, you know, on, on the, on the, on the table, but I, I hadn't well, read a lot of them. And so for, for listeners who are like me, who kind of are coming to you clean, who are, who are not one of the many, many, many people who have bought your books, why don't you just give us your kind of origin story for how you got into writing thrillers and then how you started to sort of become a you know, a political commentator as well. So I grew up in Chicago, went to a very small liberal arts high school, progressive liberal arts high school called Francis Parker. Uh, Ann H. was a classmate of mine, uh, God rest her soul, who just passed away not too long ago. Uh, Billy Zane was a senior and a buddy of mine, the actor, uh, Green Lantern, Titanic. Yeah, sure, yeah. It was Billy, no, Billy Zane was the Phantom. It was Ryan Reynolds was Green Lantern. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, sorry, I could mess those two up. Uh, but we anyway, need a JVL on here to correct your uh, correct the, the record on comic out. book stuff. But like uh, Daryl Hannah, Jennifer Beals, we had a lot of interesting people come out of Francis Parker uh, and go on to Hollywood and, and do neat things in the arts. So uh, I grew up, uh, the arts were something to make you better around it. They were not a career path. My dad had gotten out of the south side of Chicago with the U.S. Uh, Marine Corps. My mom had been a flight attendant for TWA in the glamour days wow. in the 60s. And she flew Paris, New York, New York, Paris. And I went out to the University of Southern California for college as a business major and hated it, absolutely hated it. And I took a test that's, I think they call it the strong inventory now. It used to be called the strong Campbell personality test and scored off the charts for writing and publishing and decided that's what I wanted to do. And Hmm. uh, when I graduated college, I did the the thing no American had ever done. I moved to Paris to write a novel. Had never (laughs) been done by an American now. And uh, I got a couple chapters into it and I quit. I was afraid of failure. What would happen if I wrote a crummy book and I couldn't get it sold, whatever. And so I'd had this idea for a TV show that I wanted to do, a travel show, because I thought travel made me a better American. And I'd done a lot of get a backpack, that kind of a thing. So I pitched, I came back from France and I pitched public, I'd lived in Greece for a summer and tended bar. I came back and pitched public television. I've got this idea for a TV show for 18 to 34 year olds go to Europe on a budget because at that time, Rick Steves was like the only game on public television. Sick. And so they loved it. We did it. I was the producer, writer, and host. And then fast forward, uh, I get married and I'm on my honeymoon and my wife and I are having a drink somewhere uh, in Italy. And she asked me a question, probably you want to ask a potential spouse before you uh, tie the knot. Yeah. It was, uh, what would you regret on your deathbed never having done? And I said, writing a book and getting it published. And she said, okay, when we get home, you got to start spending two hours a day making that dream come true. And that became my first novel. What a woman. Thank yeah, God for that. Um, yeah. uh, so uh, I want to get back to kind of the writing process um, stuff towards the end. Um, but, uh, you know, so the books themselves, 
uh, you know, the are mostly are, I, I think you call them faction. It's a lot of, you know, it's a lot of stuff that's happening in national security world, foreign affairs world. So, you know, t- talk to us about that, how you kind of got into that world and sort of how that led to you, you know, also you know, being kind of a commentator on national security <laughs> affairs and then eventually actually literally being asked for advice from the government about this sort of stuff. Uh, and it's funny because, yeah, like two years ago, I had set a book uh, in open. So I so people haven't read a Brad Forth thriller before. It's yeah, James Bond, that. Tom Clancy. It's very international intrigue. And I try to find something that's happening in the world of kind of geopolitics to act as the background that everything gets set against. So uh, I, I, Stephen King once said that you should write what you love to read because that's where your passion is. And I I believe that's true. And so I grew up, particularly in the summers, stealing books from my parents. When they would set a book down on the porch at our cottage in Wisconsin, they'd finish a Clancy, a Ludlum, a Le Carre. I'd steal it and I'd read it. And I always loved these books. And I always knew that if I was going to write a book, that's the genre I'd want to write in. Hmm. And so that's what I do. And I say faction is what I do because you don't know where the facts end and the fiction begins. So uh, I think I was one or two... I was very early in my career. I think my first book had just come out uh, when uh, something got put together by the government called the Analytic Red Cell Unit. And it was put together at the Department of Homeland Security. And they realized that 9-11 happened. And as you and I are recording this, it's the anniversary yes. of 9-11 today. And I'm over in Paris. And I'm assuming you're in New Orleans. Yeah. Uh, so... I got this call and it was like a scene out of a movie. I'm hiking. We were living in the mountains of Park City, Utah at that point in time. And I'm hiking with my dog in a place where I get no bars on my cell phone. And all of a sudden the cell phone rings and I get asked to come to DC and be part of this program. And so what it was is bringing creative thinkers into DC from outside the beltway to help the government think three or four steps ahead of the bad guys. So it's people like me, Michael Bay, the director of the Transformers movies. Uh, yeah, it was really wild. And they put us in there and, and had us dream up scenarios. Uh, they'd give us, you know, there were parts, uh, points in time where you thought they were giving you clues that they couldn't figure out how to put together. Like if you had a pair of, you know, Air Jordans from like the uh, mid 80s and then you had a train ticket that should have gone this direction and then a cell phone that was bought in Jakarta. And all this stuff was in a bag and dropped in a canal in Amsterdam. How might you connect these yeah. wild stuff? But being the son of a United States Marine, it was an honor to be asked to serve my country, not by picking up a rifle like my dad did, but by using you know my my creative power between my ears. Yeah. And so I, I was listening to an interview you were doing uh, where you're kind of talking about this. And it's not just the Red Cell program. Um, uh, and, and we might go down that rabbit hole a little bit more in a minute. But also your... Um, you know, kind of, you do a lot of interviews for these books. I, you know, I, I, these thrillers books. You have to speak to people that are in intelligence agencies. You have to, you, you know, learn about how the diplomatic process mm-hmm. works um, in a deep way for for these books to have a sense of realism. As, you know, for us, for somebody that is, you know, whose dad served but is an outsider. And and one thing that you said that caught my attention, you were actually on a kind of a MAGA podcast. This was a while ago, and I almost I noticed the host kind of catch catch themselves a little bit when you said this. And it was, uh, the deeper I get into this, the more thoughtful and intelligent the government works, at least on the diplomatic and intelligent side. So I, basically, you know, what your, your take was, you know, for all of this discussion about you know, all of the incompetence and the lack of trust that we have these days in our institutions, like the more you've kind of dug in and, and interviewed, the more you've kind of been blown away by like how how there's like a lot of competence. I'm not this isn't saying the government's perfect or whatever, but so you know, just kind of talk this, you know, take that wherever you want to take it about how what your sense is for that, having you know, kind of dug into these institutions a little bit. So you're you're hitting me very close to home because it's the whole Tom Nichols death of expertise and yes. uh, the whole populism thing, right? Where there's yeah. this erosion of trust in institutions. And uh, listen, when I got asked to join the analytic red cell unit. I, that's the most forward-thinking and aggressive program I've ever seen the federal government engage in. I was so proud to be part of it. Um, it was just amazing. They were honestly doing everything they could. There were no holds barred on making sure we didn't have another 9-11. So the deeper I got into that world, whether it was on the diplomatic side, whether it was on the intelligence side, the special operations side, uh, the more books I wrote, the more doors were open to me and the more people I got to meet. And I really do believe that, Tim, that these men and women that are out there doing particularly some of the nation's most dangerous business are some of our absolute best and most committed because they're not doing it for the paycheck. That's for damn sure. I mean, they love what they do, but they're doing it because they believe in the mission. They believe in the people they're serving with. So 
I found that the deeper I got in, uh, this is pre-2016, pre-MAGA, pre-populism, yeah. which is so corrupted, so much stuff. Not everybody. I've been proud of some people's behavior, and I've been absolutely shocked uh, by other people's. I've actually lost friendships with people who are members of Congress because I've just said, you know, you're basically, you're an asshole. Yeah. Uh, this is about an oath to the Constitution, not to Mango Mussolini. So I've been I've been shocked on the political end, but I continue to be heartened by the people that I meet who are actually doing the boots on the ground day to day stuff that's required to keep the nation moving and secure. Keep it going forward. Yeah. What was your take? Uh, that makes me wonder, you know, so then when Trump comes in, uh, you know, because you had, you know, relationships in this world, kind of, as I said, I, you know, the book, I guess it's not really surprising, right? That like national security oriented, you know, uh, Republicans, uh, you know, were kind of attracted to your book. And, and, you know, as I said, you started doing some commentaries that you talked about on, on that on Fox. And, and mm -hmm. so you had these relationships, uh, you know, and then some of them, you know, I, I think we can, we can put the con Congress critters in a bucket for a second and talk about them in a minute. <laughs> but the people that like went into the Trump administration, I always thought this was such a tough question, you know, because on, one of my uh, best friends became the national security advisor. Yeah. This, so this is what I want to ask you. What do you think about that? Right. Because at some level, I thought going in being a Robert O'Brien, as we're talking about, yep. is uh, like one becoming national buddies. security advisor. You know, that's one thing. I guess I'd rather have Robert O'Brien there than Corey Lewandowski or whatever as national oh. security advisor, you know. But yeah. then other people, you know, I felt like were uh, uh, maybe didn't have as good of a rationalization for going in. And and I thought even the Robert O'Briens of the world, you know, over time end up kind of getting corrupted. Right. Like you think you're pull, you're you think you are moving Trump to the same world and actually Trump's kind of moving you to the crazy world. So anyway, I'm just curious what you're thought about and then you know about uh, both your friend robert but also just in general about that concept yeah so uh, you know listen i think i think robert did a fantastic job i've been a it, it's interesting robert and i were neighbors when i was in college i mean we go back that far which is yeah. really interesting we stood off the roof of my apartment building during the la riots after the rodney king verdict uh keeping wow. a watch because we were above a air one health food store and anything that had a cash register was getting like looted and then burnt which meant our building would have gone up and so we we're all taking shifts i think robert did a very good job and i think it's because robert has an ability to put his ego aside. Robert realized his job was there to advise the president of the United States. It was not to not to try to mold him. He here's your menu of options. Uh, here's you rank them, all that kind of stuff. And of course, I don't have top secret security clearance, so there's sure. a ton of stuff that I'll never know that happened in the room and that kind of stuff. But uh, you know, Robert saw that job through right to the end. And uh, you know, look at how scary the Department of Justice was getting. Right yeah. there at the end where they were trying to put Jeffrey Clark in. And I mean, who knows what kind of a, you know, you had the thing with Flynn where Flynn was uh, lied to the FBI and he was found guilty. I mean, he was kind of the original national security advisor. So I, I have to tell you, I would rather see Robert O'Brien do that job. And listen, Robert's a really good guy. He's a deeply religious, conservative Mormon guy. I mean, he's as honest as day is long. I mean, you really could not pick a better person to serve in the, in an administration in any capacity, in my opinion, uh, better than Robert. I mean, he really understands the position. It's not about him. It's about the administration that he's serving. So I was proud of the job he did. Yeah. On the other side of that, though, is, you know, you, know, you get after after what happened in Lafayette Park. Uh, that you know, was terrible. Yes. Yeah. That and then was obviously horrible. you get January 6th. And then it's like, I wonder, like, what is so? Let's do a little mini red cell program here. Um, uh, for about it's, but this is about domestic threats, not foreign. Um, uh, how would you feel about that if Trump, God forbid, wins again? Like, what do you do then? Yeah. Like, can you really go back in and and feel good about serving in that administration? But on the other hand, don't we? Do, do we almost need? Do, do we need an actual deep state? Uh, they've been imagining a deep state for a long time, <laughs> but do we need deep state spies to go in there uh, to try to save the republic? I mean, what? How do you how do you gain that a situation like that out? So that's that's interesting. I think it's funny because for the longest time we've heard the left talk about the electoral college and how you know it's not fair. And you yeah. know I always remind my friends on the left of two things. I always tell them that the word democracy does not appear anywhere in the founding documents. Uh, and then I also love to stick the shiv in and break off the handle on Mitt Romney. I'm like, you know what? Thank God we never got Mitt Romney. And binders full of women. Yes. Remember what a terrible guy Mitt Romney was? Right. And I said, you know, this is this is what happens when we catastrophize politics. It really gets us to a place that all of us took for granted we'd never get there, right? The system yeah. was going to hold. The courts have done extremely well. 
So back to your question about, uh, you know, let's say Robert O'Brien, if he gets tapped, does he go back and serve again as a national security advisor? I don't know. I can't answer for Robert. I think he did a really good job. And listen, Robert's, uh, the Iranians tried Robert in absentia in uh, in Tehran for being involved in the Soleimani hit. So he's still under threat from Iran. So he he sacrificed a lot for the country. I know him personally, and I have the utmost confidence in, in who he is. He's one of the guys, yes, I would like to see if, God forbid, Trump got elected again, I would be able to sleep much better at night knowing Robert O'Brien was there advising him uh, as his national security advisor. And then if he calls up. you, if he calls you and he says, "Hey, I need a I need a PR advisor to come in." <laughs> no, in, no, 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 no. I'd probably last like one Scaramucci, you know, <laughs> one Scaramucci, I, I, okay. because I can't fluff the guy, and I yeah. won't fluff the guy. I mean, and I, I and I'm friends with Scaramucci with uh, with Anthony, and you know, the guy. Oh, and the thing about he throws perfect spirals and stuff. That's like Kim Jong Un level. And when they went yeah. around the table and they were all saying Both. why they were so honored to serve, it's disgusting. We, as a, you know, it's that old line that people get the government they deserve. Well, the fact is the majority of this country does not deserve another Trump administration. We haven't done anything wrong to deserve that. And I hope, I hope it doesn't happen. But regardless of who serves in that office, I want them to have the best people, the most talented people for that job. And what ends up happening, because Trump is such a buffoon, is that a lot of the A-list people won't serve. And so that hurts the country. That's another reason not to elect Trump because he can't attract all of the top talent. He can get some talent, but then you get a lot of C and D listers that make Kathy Griffin look like she's an A lister because, because they, they, they want to sniff the throne. They want to get close to power. And some of these people like the Kraken lady, Sidney Powell, and these people are never, ever going to get near to a white house ever again in their lifetimes. And this was their shot. And so there was that allure power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. And it attracts those remora. You know, well, that I always, this is just always, the, this is like a game theory thing I always struggle with. Uh, and I've gone, I've gone back and forth with many people on it. I'm just always interested to hear your different points of view. Cause like, I was kind of of the view that these people shouldn't have gotten in and that, that we should have gotten to see, everybody should have gotten to see the, you know, full Trump. And maybe that would have <laughs> protected us in the future, uh, from, from taking risks like this. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that we should have let, you know, let Trump do it, all the fucking crazy shit he was going to do and not have like John Kelly's in there kind of like part, you know, yeah, sometimes nah. restraining him, sometimes, going, you know, protecting yeah. him for his worst instincts. Okay. Yeah. But I actually think that that argument has been weakened by January 6th, right? Cause the, my theory of the case was once we see the true nature right. of the beast, then people will, We're gonna will, wake up, will, will wake yeah. up. But then we saw the true nature of the beast, and not very many people woke up, it seems like. 91 indictments now we're up to, yeah. uh, four arrests. I mean, listen, this is this is a, this is a cult, and I, I wish I could remember who pointed this out, but all cults end badly. So yeah. I, don't want, I don't want it to end badly for the United States. And I think some of the good people, like a Kelly, like a Mattis, like a Robert O'Brien, who went in and served, did it out of that sense of service, you know, who wanted to go in and do the right thing for the country and— uh, you know, there was a whole thing about keeping guardrails on Trump. But I, I, listen, I've been exactly where you were, too, about saying this yeah. guy's got a flounder. He's got a But the but it's the price of the floundering. Yes, right. I want Trump to absolutely have his his political career wrecked by his own behavior. But who pays for it in the right. end? You know, it's the rest of the country. So at some point there has to be a sense of, yeah, that guy down the street beats his wife and it's none of my business. But, you know, I'm, I'm going to call the cops on that guy. Uh, it's a that's a terrible analogy. I was reaching yeah. for something. I'm going to blame the jet lag, but <laughs> at, at some point you do have to I do the you. right thing, yeah. and that's so I I have absolution there. But I draw the line at like what Mike Pence did, which was constantly kind of covering for him and all that right. kind of stuff. You know, so yeah, like there is a line, day. and I, yeah, yeah, there is a line there that I think we can say people should be on this side and not on that side. And I, I just think as good a man as I, I believe Mike Pence is at his core, I, I he's somebody that I think did did a bad job in there. What did you think about the so Pence gave the speech recently at, where he talks about how you know right now we're in this battle for the soul of. Talking about party. conservatism versus it, populism. It, conservatism and, yeah. versus populism. And, you know, we've been doing a little bit on here about how, like, actually, Mike Pence, your, your name was on the bumper sticker on the populist side of the war. It already yeah, happened. Yeah. Like, it, yeah. uh, it, it's, been, it's been going on nine years now. Now you want to switch teams, and that's fine. Um, I, I, I'm just curious your take on this. Obviously, you fall on the more traditional conservative side in this. Uh, are you as, 
uh, as uh, pessimistic, you know, as maybe me and JVL um, about that. I mean, I, I'm basically of the view that that war is over, and that like the the, the you know maybe in a, a generation or something that the party might might turn back over. But but for the foreseeable future, you know, kind of the populist side is won, and the and the, the old you know classically liberal side of the Republican Party is dead. Where where do you kind of fall on that? Well, and Charlie discussion? says the same thing. Charlie thinks yeah. we're a generation away from from shaking this. Um, Listen, the, the one thing I refuse to give up is my Sonny Reagan optimism. My belief okay. that anything in America is possible, right? It's, 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 but it's the hope that kills I you. I won't try to take uh, that from you. I won't take that okay, away good, from you. Everybody good, deserves right. a little bit of hope, you know? A little bit. If it was JVL, I know he'd be going real, real dark on me <laughs> trying to do that. Um, listen, I think populism is a cancer. And uh, Donald Trump is a demagogue. And going back to even Cleon of Athens... The founders were concerned about demagogues. Uh, in yeah. fact, there's a reason that uh, George Washington came. Uh, he was very involved after uh, he left office, particularly right after uh, when a new president was being elected, because he was very worried that after the after his term and particularly after the Revolutionary War, that we were a very weak country that could be taken advantage of by a demagogue. So this the the perils that a nation can face at the hands of a demagogue, uh, we've known about ever since our founding. So I am i don't know how we weed that out. And I think social yeah. media is the one thing, obviously, the founders could never have seen coming. These people have isolated themselves in the silos where they're only talking to people who think like them, and they're only getting their news that people feed in from Newsmax and OAN and that kind of stuff. And what we also have is people who know better, people in, you know, uh, Sarah does her triangle of doom thing and yeah. everything. But there's this whole thing um, where if if we were better able to reach these people with truth, uh, you would hope we'd have a better outcome. But these are also people that are rushing out to take ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine because they didn't trust the uh, the, the COVID vaccines. I, I just don't know that some of these people are persuadable, enough of them. And it's crazy to think that the next election could come down to fifty thousand votes uh, in the, a couple, a handful of counties. That that kind of people getting in their own silos and uh, and on social media is something I wanted to ask you about, actually, because uh, I think in a weird way, um, you you in theory at least, right? I could could be uniquely positioned to kind of be a person that has, uh, you know, an ability to you know kind of slowly you know, help a couple of people, walk, you know, tiptoe away from the abyss. And, and I say this because, you know, I, I think that I, not entirely, I assume um, that, but, you know, you'd built an audience um, that had a lot of conservative readers. And, and I, so I assume that you had Trump Liberal voters. Liberal ones too? Yeah. Liberal, yeah I would yeah, never yeah. open a yeah, I'm sure you had a, a sign that says no blacks, no Jews, no gays. Of course. I, I'm open to everybody. Of, of everybody. course, of course. I just mean by the Try nature of, of, you know, whatever the your material career. That I, I think that there's yes. certainly been, let's just put it this way. Some people that voted for Donald Trump read your books and that's, that's a good thing. I, I, right. I, we don't want people totally siloed. And my right. point is that the, those of us who come from the pure political world, you know, they're like the mag voter is a lot of times going to point their finger at us. It's like, you know, it's like why for Arvat, you know, our whole campaign was based around real people explaining why they weren't voting for Donald Trump because mm -hmm. Donald Trump voters don't want to hear from fucking DC consultants telling them what to do. All right. We're, we're literally the worst possible messengers. And so since you are kind of like this writer and, and you're writer of thrillers and you kind of commentated on, on politics, like in some ways, Maybe these folks listen to you. I, I, so anyway, I'm just curious. Like, have you had any experience from that? I, have you had readers say, "Screw you, Brad. I'm never reading you anymore." I, have you had people been like, "Man, I, I kind of appreciated hearing your perspective on this because my whole world was all MAGA people." Uh, anyway, what, what's your so, what's your experience been on that? So, uh, I think if Andrew Breitbart came back from the dead, he'd be shocked to see what his site has turned into, to be honest with you, uh, you know, with the influence of Steve Bannon there and everything. Right, Bart had a great line, which is politics is downstream of culture. You say that all the time, yeah. all the time. Politics is downstream of culture, and it's true. So I'm an entertainer. So my job, first and foremost, is to entertain my audience. Mm -hmm. But if you close one of my books smarter, then I think I've done my job as an American. If you're asking questions, and I'll give you an example. And I know we're going to talk about the new book uh, towards the end of the podcast, yeah. but I actually put into the new book one of the things that I'm most concerned about politically, which is this siloing. So I actually have a part of the story that's about, because I say this all the time, any chance I get, that the Russians, the, the Iranians, the North Koreans, and the Chinese love to push on all of our cultural fractures here. Mm -hmm. There are pressure points that they can push on to turn us against each other. And so if you're in a Facebook group 
uh, if you're in your silo, your guard is down because you think everybody thinks like you. So when the bad guys try to inter inject disinformation and things like that, you are highly susceptible to it. You don't have antibodies to it because you're just right. trusting every. It's like you know the 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 old guys that you should just forward every email they got without check too good to check sort of a thing. So I mean, it my literally happened. There was that fake Tennessee Republican Party account. Everybody thought mother. it was the real Republican Party. It was the Russians. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. I live in Tennessee, and I used to spar with those assholes. Oh, I hated those guys. And I said, this can't be. I, so I don't want to turn people away from my books, okay? It's sure. an interesting phenomenon because during Barack Obama, the right was all united. You know, we didn't have all of this infighting and all that kind of stuff. And if you were right of center, you were welcome on Fox. Yeah. But then stuff happens, and uh, it's a different world because people are narrowcasting. They are... Yeah, it's it's the same thing with the, you know the New York Times firing conservative people because the newsroom the young twenty somethings get upset there. It it it's the danger of fan service, right? So you want to be very very careful. And like I said, if I, I try to put in issues that I think liberals should be concerned about, independents, Republicans, be you a MAGA Republican, be you a you know a Jeb Bush Republican, that right. stuff. That I I think that nine eleven happened. So to, to back to nine eleven. When, when Al Qaeda targeted uh, the Twin Towers, it wasn't because it was full of Republicans. And if they ever come back right. and try to hit the subway system, it's not going to be because it's full of Democrats. They're not going to say, let me see your voter registration. And they say, oh, you better take the bus today. They were out to kill Americans. So I think regardless of where you fall on the political spectrum, you should want a healthy functioning democracy. We don't have a healthy functioning democracy now. I mean, you've got guys like Tommy Tuberville, you've got Rand Paul, I mean, doing stuff that you know, a decade ago, even we would have thought was even just as outrageous as it is now. But we should want America to do well. So, yeah, there's a reason they come for the writers and artists first, right? When they take over, yeah. they're out to do the purges and stuff. It's because we do find clever ways to get those messages across and stuff like that. But uh, again, I'm trying to write a, an entertaining book, but also warn people of stuff outside the fiction that is a clear and present danger. Uh, if that, so I'm, just, I'm I mean, just the, generally, like when you are out doing the book sendings, like, do you get, like, are people, do they give you feedback about your non book stuff? Are they like, I saw you doing this every or, day you know? on Facebook? I mean, you every do, day. I mean, well, not the non, non book stuff. I mean, you'll, you'll get people that say, oh, that's interesting. Like, I did a whole thing. I did, I created something in DC called the Commodore Yacht Club, where there's this whole crazy conspiracy that the Russians spun around this thing. And it's built on pylons. Okay. There's no basement. It was kind of comet ping pong showing, you know, the pizza place and the whole pizza yeah. gate thing. It was making fun of that sort of a thing and showing right. how stupid it is to fall for this stuff because yeah. people are lazy. OK, I, I don't think so many people that say uh, who's the guy is it Jordan Kepler for The Daily Show that yeah, goes yeah, out yeah, and Klepper, yeah. all the Trump support. Uh, Ke Klepper. He's fantastic. He's fantastic because it's like the facts. So I like to play with that stuff a little bit in the books, uh, but not I don't want to harm uh, I, I don't want to beat people, people over the head with it. I get it. Exactly. Exactly. I, I want to show, hey, this stuff is dangerous and put it in a, a good white knuckle throw ride. And if I can do that, then great. That's a bonus for me yeah. as an American. It's, well, I'd like to hear, we, we should almost do like a test. I don't know. Uh, you, you're willing to do the red cell program. Maybe we need like a never Trump or red, red cell unit where we, I, I feel like that in some ways you're just a softer you know, way to just kind of casually get like a just a just a dose of sanity right uh you know if we're if we're gonna have dump Sarah somebody hire me for a focus yeah, group. Sarah, that's what i'm saying because if you dump if you we dump the charlie <laughs> sykes podcast straight into these people you know they're just gonna they're just gonna get pissed okay but yeah. uh you know maybe through uh through the, you know maybe we need some short stories some some little uh so some little metaphors well, and, uh, and but, what's the old is it the old christian thing go to where they're at and bring them to where they yeah, need to exactly. be yeah exactly you know what i mean i yeah, mean listen there's some there parables people, can you do some parables maybe i, I can do some that. parables and i also think that one of the things we do at our own peril as moderate centrists i mean i have gotten a lot I'm, i've always been socially inclusive my conservative yeah. conservatism was always small government and and spending yeah. I, with tons of gay friends. I, I mean, I, sure. I just don't care about that stuff. I, I think America is the place where you should be free to do There's what you want. The writing program in USC, you met, you met gay people. That's that's surprising. Well, I, I, <laughs> I lived in LA. I lived off campus. I mean, I came to Paris. I'm staying in the Marais. You can't yeah. get you can't get more dead center gay and gay Paris than the Marais where I am now. Um, you know, so I, I think globalization did leave a lot of people behind. I think yeah. we as a nation were not thinking what happens when these products are being made overseas for less money 
And these jobs no longer exist for these people who've been in some of these jobs, their families generationally. You know, we have a big problem with recruiting in the military now because some of the grandfathers and fathers who have been in the service or the grandmothers and mothers who would normally be encouraging the next generation to sign up are saying, ah, they're too woke now. Don't do it. So, you know, we, we do things that we may think are good for whatever reason, but we're not good at looking at full uh, uh, implications of what might happen with these yeah. things. So this uh, that actually takes me. So I want to kind of go around the horn on a couple of political issues that sort of overlap with themes in, in, in your books. Um, uh, one of them is what you're talking about right there is this uh, that the military, this kind of idea that the military is getting getting too woke. Um, you know, everybody kind of chimes poetry off Poetry on, on ships. Yeah, there's poetry <laughs> on ships now. Watch out, you know. Um, uh, China's going to eat our lunch. And the Navy might go gay. Uh, you never know. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, then there's some or more some more serious discussion. I mean, Millie obviously discussed about, you know, how they need to care about white rage. You know, in that hearing, uh, that created a lot of white rage in response to that yeah. uh, comment. But, I, you know, I, I don't. I don't, the military is in my world, right? So you just, you talk to a lot of military folks to do prep for these books. So I'm just, just curious your kind of take on that critique. Is there, is there anything to it? Is there nothing to it? Um, you know, where, where, where do you fall on that? So I talk to a lot of people that don't like it. Okay. That are career military people. They don't like this. People by their nature are resistant to change, right? People right. don't like change. Um, and so this is pretty fairness, dramatic. There were a lot of military people that didn't, that liked Don't Ask, Don't Tell and didn't want to change that. And that turned out See? just fine. And, right, and you know. it, turned out, it turned out just fine. I, and I was always with Dennis Miller uh, with this. It's like, I don't care who you sleep with. As long as you're in the fox hole and you know how to run your rifle next to me, that's all I care about. Right. That's all I care about. What you do in your bedroom is your business. And I've always been that way. I've always, you know, if two people want to be married, what do you care if it's two men, two women? Sure. It shouldn't, in a country that prides itself on freedom, we should not want to limit the freedoms of other people. I mean, that's, I, but I, I think what you're seeing, again, I talked about the globalization and jobs for certain groups going away. I think, again, with not changing, uh, we we have to change though, if we want an all volunteer force, right? We right. have to go to where these people are and bring them in uh, and encourage them to serve. I remember watching a Marine recruiter, uh, a, a piece on a Marine recruiter and the Marines are fabulous. They meet their numbers all the time. And one of these Marines was talking to a kid like in Compton or something like that. And, oh, why would I want to be a Marine? And he's like, when I pulled up, I heard you listen to Shaggy. Did you know Shaggy was a Marine? And the kid's like, no way. You know, and so that was going to where that particular kid was at, right? Using right. pop culture, all that kind of stuff. So uh, I think that as our numbers go down, we have to be creative with how we recruit. Uh, and I think it's important. And I think if you don't like change, I'm sorry. Life is change. Yeah. It's going to constantly be changing. Yeah. I always kind of reject, um, you know, I th sometimes you just need to step back and think about common sense a little bit in this discussion. And it's like, okay, the, who are they recruiting, right? They're recruiting teenagers mostly, mm -hmm. right? And, yep. uh, you know, fo folks that are uh, uh, um, in their early 20s. And so, sure, I, and there, it's, there's certainly some young MAGA kids that really don't like all the woke stuff and maybe it would turn them off. But like, what do you think, if you were 19 right now and you're thinking, do I want to join the military or not? Like, do you think that poetry on ships is going to be the thing that makes your decision? Or do you think maybe the thing preventing people from being in the military is that there's just not a lot of pride in what, like, the military has d done in the last quarter century, right? If you're 19 years old, all you've experienced is the the back half of the Iraq war, you know, all, you know, all of the problems with that, that, that war, you know, all of the... Uh, deaths, you know, you you now seen the retreat from Afghanistan that was handled poorly. Now this funding of Ukraine, which I want to get into next, like I, that seems to be kind of working, but that hasn't been our boots on the ground, right? And so right. you look at this and, and you're like, why would I? I uh, these guys are going to send me into fucking Fallujah, uh, like for a you know unclear mission, right? I, you know, like wh I don't don't we think that the recruiting problems has been more based on the the way we've been waging wars the last two decades and not you know whether like, uh, you know, there are a couple of generals like reading critical race theory, uh, you know, <laughs> um, pamphlets. I, I, I can't imagine that you with Iraq and Afghanistan going on that you would ever walk into a recruiting station not thinking I could end up over there. I mean, you, right. there's no way you could not have that it'd be part of your process. So it's interesting. So, you know, particularly the, the, the nationalist populist right does not like the, the stuff that the Department of Defense is doing. They, they're so woke and all this kind of stuff. Yet 
you guys are eroding one of the uh, one of the prime reasons to serve is, is patriotism and the, the pride right. in serving an institution and being part of something greater than yourself. And so it's kind of uh, they're tearing it down on both ends, which is which is unfortunate, because even if you got uh, got rid of all the wokeness, I, I this is the problem. This is why culture wars are so stupid is because each side thinks they're losing and there's yes. no way to tell when you're winning. That's the problem. There is no end to the culture war. It's always going to be something else that pops up. I mean, it is the biggest waste of it's the biggest waste of time and energy, to be honest. Yeah, take a W. I, yeah, no. Megan Kelly yesterday exactly. was was tweeting complaining that the U.S. Open tennis final was woke because there were Moderna ads and they sang "America the Beautiful" instead of the national anthem. And I was like, "America the Beautiful" and pharma ads are woke now. Like this is like, like what is even? What are we fucking talking about anymore? I, you know. Anyway. Yeah, um, and I, you know what, I, I happen to be friends with Megan, and I like her a lot, um, and I, I just don't know, again, is it fan service, is it is it serving that audience, giving them that red meat that they that they want? There was just some big thing, and I, uh, you know, I've known Ben Shapiro for years, and there was just the, oh, the thing where they were saying that, uh, what was the, oh, the, 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 the whole rape thing ought to be uh, treated as seriously as E. Jean Carroll's claims. Uh, oh, is it Danny uh, Masterson? Yeah, Who was yeah. it that they were no, comparing no, it to? No, I think no. They were, I think they were comparing the fake Obama gay story right, to Right, that's Jean what Carroll. it was. Yeah, that you was, dismantled yeah, on the bulwark. Yeah, it was yeah, Larry exactly. Sinclair. Uh, yeah, which is, I mean, the E. Jean Carroll thing has, I mean, as as you, as you has been said, she had all those uh, contemporaneous accounts. She told people that it's been adjudicated in front of a jury and all this stuff. So you get... I, I just think that the hardcore MAGA right just wants to be entertained. They don't want to be challenged. They want to be told that what they're thinking is right and that the way they see the world is right and everything's terrible. Listen, nothing fuels the clicks like rage. Uh, yeah. You get people angry to get them out to the polls and you get them angry to keep tuning into your show. I mean, we've joked around about that Fox logo, that bug being burned into TV sets because yeah. people just don't turn them off in the retirement homes and other places. So uh, it may take a generation not only to get the poison out of the younger blood steering, but to get some of these older people. Uh, I, I don't know that you'll ever reach the older ones. I just yeah. I think there there's a lot of them that unfortunately will never get back to sanity. Um, to, let's talk about Tuberville for a second. Um, I, one thing that I've been, and, and, you know, I just want to put a quarter in the machine and let you rant about, how, rant, rant about him first, but, but secondly, it, I don't know if you've had any conversations with the military folks. The thing I don't understand is why aren't even conservative military folks more mad at him? I, I mean, like this is a, I, I don't, are, isn't there frustration that I, that we can't go about the business of the country? Um, we've right had now? three service heads come out and say as much. So, yeah. I mean, you've got people in there. So there's, at least on the professional military side, there is a history of not getting involved on the political side, not saying anything. You know, yeah. it's that whole thing. You know, Kelly didn't say anything even after he left the Trump administration. Mattis didn't say anything. And, you know, we really could have used a lot more of that. But there's that there's that tradition there that that is a kind of a sacred thing. You don't cross that line. Uh, listen, Tuberville's a jackass. Uh, the fact that one guy. Listen, this is this is the problem we have in this country. There are a lot of kind of norms and uh, traditions that we would follow. And all it takes in this case is one guy like Tuberville to screw everything up. So you know, I think we're learning now that as much as we wanted to trust people to operate uh, in the best interest of the country, uh, we just we're going to need to rejigger some stuff in Congress because the fact that Tuberville can hold up all of this stuff and can imperil the nation's readiness and national security, it's terrible. And the guy really is, and it's not a very uh, deep pool of competition. I, I mean, well, it's actually the pool's not deep, but it's very crowded at the shallow end. I mean, he really is one of the dumbest guys in Congress. He's not the. He, I, I don't know if we could award him the dumbest, but uh, there's a lot of competition for the title. It is a competitive category, uh, but I, yeah. I think he's. I think that he's even got Marsha Blackburn by the nose. Um, uh, uh, my uh, senator, Marsha uh, Blackburn, yeah. Box um, of rocks. Yeah. yeah, I forgot. I forgot you're in Tennessee. What's your? I moved how, ten years ago from Chicago. Yeah. How do you feel? I, uh, you know, I've had a, just by coincidence a couple of Tennessee folks on this show, including Gloria Johnson, who's running against Marshall Blackburn, and I, you know, living there, um, you know, and I get this question about Louisiana, having just moved here. Like, at times, do you ever feel like, man, I. The, the government I, I, shit is getting actually to a point where where the laws that are being passed are, are a little bit too much to tolerate. And I do. What, what's your take on just kind of the local 
Um, you know, because for a while, a lot of this stuff was confined to national politics, right? And, I, and yeah. I, feel, I feel like really it's been in the last two years, not that there weren't always dumb bills and then fucking every state red or blue, right? But, but it's been particularly yeah. acute that's about state legislators advancing really far right cultural policies. What, what's your feeling okay. about that? Like just being around Tennessee, is there any backlash to that starting to happen among your, you know, community? Well, not no, really. not, not, not really. I mean, if you've got, if you've got a daughter who may need to get an abortion, it's an issue now, you know what yeah. I mean? And if you've got uh particularly gay or transgender children, it's an issue now. I mean, right. it's a, it's a big deal. So, you know, we left Chicago because the violence was increasing and my taxes never decreased. They kept going yeah. up. So I felt right. like I was living on an island because I'd have to sell the babysitter. Don't take the kids to the beach. Too many gangs down there. Don't go to the zoo. Too many, too much trouble there. So I was paying more and more money for a bit of property, an area of Chicago that I could enjoy. It was just getting swallowed up by all yeah. the bad stuff in Chicago. So it's like, what's my alternative? I moved to Tennessee for more freedom, particularly uh, no taxes and and very light hand on business and things like that. But so what's my choice, Tim? Where am I, where am I going to move First. if I leave Tennessee? Right. Where am I going to strike a balance? I, I'm certainly not interested. Yeah, now in Tennessee's coming into... for your freedoms from the right. You know, it's like you can't, uh, you know, you they're, can't they're find like an oasis. Book banning and stuff. I mean, it's, I it's, it's nuts. And I certainly don't want to go to Florida under DeSantis, uh, you know, so... I, I just don't. It, Colorado's a nice nuts. balance. I wish I could live there, my home state. Uh, you know, Jared Polis is a nice centrist governor. Uh, Spencer Cox doing all right next door in Utah. Something in the water in the Mountain West, maybe. But I no, we I feel this way there. too. I get sometimes our liberal listeners get mad at me. They're like, "How could you have moved to Louisiana?" Da, 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 da. And I'm like, yeah, "Well, first, I, I you know, <laughs> let's let everybody make personal decisions for themselves." But you know, I came from Oakland. We had two bullet holes in our house. Like, Ooh, you know, and the know prices that. of price of, uh, uh, you know, the prices to live in a different neighborhood in, in the Bay Area are are just not, you know, on the level of a podcaster's uh, what a podcaster can afford, <laughs> you know. And so I like, OK, I, 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 you know, I like California. I don't know. I didn't have anything against it. I loved living there for a few years. But, you know, everybody's got to make decisions. I'm not really that interested in living in the suburbs. I was able to move to a place that, you know, I mean, Orleans Parish went 85 percent for Biden. So it's not like exactly. You know, mm -hmm. like I moved to become David French's neighbor out there, out there, and uh, you know, David's, with the AR-15 church. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. you know, anyway, you got to find balance and all this stuff. Uh, I, I, that, that took me down a rabbit hole I wasn't planning on. I wanted to get a, uh, uh, one more thing before we get into book stuff. Um, I, I've heard you said you don't um, want your kids to be on TikTok. TikTok's yep. another one I just struggle with. Um, I, I'm on it. Uh, I, I feel like I have to be, you know, just because Not the nature my of my work, yeah. right? Um, I'm also not really that worried about the Chinese spying on me, um, but uh, I'm like, what? What are they gonna? You know, they're gonna know that I'm interested in basketball and and <laughs> you know, gay and pop and pop culture divas. <laughs> like, like, okay, all right, Chinese, now you got me. Um, but uh, anyway, the um, uh, uh, what what would be the case against it? How how worried are you about it? So uh, I thought it was important for me as somebody who's in entertainment, kind of the uh, one foot in entertainment who's also concerned about politics and the direction of the nation. I thought it was important to take a very public stand against yeah. TikTok and the dangers that are that are uh, that are, that that they uh, pose. And so uh, my kids weren't allowed to have it. They're adults now. They don't have it. They chose not to have it. So I wasn't worried that the kids were actually or that the Chinese might be gathering information from my kids per se. But I was concerned about what could the Chinese push informationally? I, you know, you control the medium, you control the message, right? So if they want to be doing stuff that is kind of contra to uh, our interest in the world or something like that, could that stuff make it into the feeds? And I've just never been a big social media guy anyway. That was an yeah. easy pick. Just it's 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 the CCP's uh, social media site. So I'm like, okay, that's one less one I got to worry about as a parent. Now I got to focus on Facebook and Instagram. So there. Um, I w so the most recent book, Deadfall, um, uh, takes place in Ukraine. And your books, I, I think I mentioned this at the start, but but um, you are really on the news, right? And and almost even pre news sometimes, right? You're trying to look into the you know kind of what are the national real national security threats. So people that are reading and are kind of experiencing something that is in relationship with what what's actually happening in the world from a national security standpoint. So. I, I want to hear about the book um, first, uh, but first, just I'm, I'm just wondering if you could just grade how you think that you know the Biden administration's been doing on Ukraine. I'd say I give him a B plus. To be That's honest, pretty with you. good. I, I think there's a lot of room for improvement. 
Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, of giving them everything they want and yeah. then sending backups of all of it. Uh, I, I listen. It's it, the moral case. If you don't like war, you want this war done as soon as possible. There's a lot of Russian kids who are losing their fathers, wives losing their husbands, just like in the Ukraine. I'm not saying the Russians are having harder, but sure. what I'm saying is, is that from a moral standpoint, we shouldn't want to see anybody else die in this for Putin. I mean, there's like plenty of kids uh, who don't have fathers now on both sides, and it's just it's horrible. So to make that happen, to end this war, we should be giving the Ukrainians everything they need, and they're not going to win it unless they have air superiority, which is why I've been a big fan of giving them the F-16s for the longest time. Uh, the attack ums missiles we'd hoped would be really good, and the Russians have been good at jamming some stuff. Uh, they need a lot more mine removing equipment. There's a lot more we could be doing for them. Uh, and listen, we we've now seen that Russia is a paper tiger. Uh, yeah. And they're, they, they, the kleptocracy over there has hollowed out their military. So we should want to see a stake driven through their heart. The Chinese would like this to drag on and would like us to keep supplying the Ukrainians with stuff out of our stockpiles. The, they, the Chinese would love that. So this thing really needs to come to an end. We, we make it come to an end by just overwhelming the Russians via the Ukrainians. Yeah. I'm taking a B plus, by the way. One of my uh, one of my kind of non-political college friends asked me this weekend, to, you know, some of them are kind of like, how are you not a, like... You know, they knew me as a college Republican. They're like, what happened to you? You know, and they're like, do you, you like Joe Biden? And I was like, I don't know. I think I'd probably give him a B minus, but that would that would give him the best grade of any president of my adult life. So sometimes you can just take B pluses where you can get them these days, Brad. You know, there's yeah, a lot of yeah. Fs out there. OK, so, yeah, so yeah. we're just going to do a B plus. Speaking of, so you, it's got to worry you a little bit that the top three. Well, maybe Nikki's passed him now, but three of the top, let's just say about 75% of the GOP vote share in the presidential primary is for people that I assume you would give their Ukraine policies somewhere between D and F and, and DeSantis and Ramaswamy and Trump. I, 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 what, I, where, what is your just reaction Wait, you mean to de- that? Hold on. We're we talking about Ron DeSantis looking yeah. each way on the debate stage before his hand goes up to see where all the other votes are. Yeah, that's a, that's a profile of courage. Uh, uh. Listen, I really believe that we should stand up for democracy, particularly in the case of the Ukrainians. I mean, the Russians invaded them. And uh, real quick piece of history that uh, listeners and viewers might not know of, when the Soviet Union broke apart, a third of their nuclear arsenal was in Ukraine. And we begged the Ukrainians, please let us help you get rid of these weapons. We'll help dismantle them. We'll help get rid of them. You can't maintain them and you can't secure them. We were afraid one of those would get stolen or more would get stolen and used against our allies, used against us. One could be lit up in New Orleans or Minneapolis or Sarasota, wherever. So the Ukrainians said, yeah, we'll do it. But we want to promise from you that we are never going to lose a, so- a square inch of our sovereign territory if we give up these nukes. So we said, fine. And they said, OK, it's called the Budapest Memorandum. Yeah, and right. We signed it and they said, get the Russians to sign it. And this is in the 90s, yeah. pre-Putin. And so what happens? 2014, Putin goes into the Donbass. And he takes a slice. It was very much, Francis Fukuyama said that history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. And what Putin did going into Eastern Ukraine is very similar to what Hitler did in Czechoslovakia. I'm going to protect ethnic Germans and Putin's protecting Russian speakers. It's so similar. So this idea that we would not live up to our commitments as Americans, that all we do is kick Putin out of the G8. That's why we have a G7 now is because we kicked the Russians out. Got a harshly worded letter from the Obama administration and a handful of sanctions. And all that did, as it did with Hitler, when he got uh, when uh, Neville Chamberlain in the Republic of France and fascist Italy gave in on the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia, it didn't slake Hitler's thirst. It just empowered him and just encouraged him. So. I think a lot of people don't know that part about history, that we promised Ukraine, get rid of the nukes, and we'll yeah. make sure Russia never overruns you. Nobody will overrun you. I'm glad you brought, brought that up. I, I, I brought up the Budapest Memorandum a lot when the fir- war first started, but you know, you, you run out of times so that you can only say stuff till you're blue in the face, but it's, it's good to bring that up, re-remind people. But uh, anyway, I got I got us distracted. I'm sorry. I did t- talk about Tiny D, uh, and uh, and all of a sudden w- I got away from where <laughs> where we were going there. So tell us about the book Deadfall takes place in Ukraine. What what's the uh, what's the premise? Okay, so I grew up loving like great World War II thrillers, like Alistair yeah. McLean, where Eagle Stare, which is a great movie with Clint Eastwood, uh, Clint Eastwood and uh, Richard Burton, and I love Band of Brothers, present day Band of Brothers, yeah. uh, 
Saving Private Ryan, Fury with Brad Pitt, where they did the whole tank thing. And I always said, I'd like to take my series protagonist. And by the way, if you haven't read a Brad Thor book before, I tell people they're like the James Bond movies. You don't need to have seen any of the previous movies to go right into the theater and see the latest one. <laughs> so what I did with Deadfall is I wanted to have an American aid worker disappear kind of behind enemy lines in Ukraine. And the Ukrainians don't have the manpower or the wherewithal to find her. And uh, so the U.S. decides we can't send a whole team in because then it's going to look to Putin like we've now committed to the war. So we're going to send our top spy in and we're going to let him try to find this woman. And he's got one thing he's got to do. If she's alive, bring her back. If she's dead, kill everybody responsible for it. And so that's what the Whoa. story is about. And it's it's so it's it's set in Ukraine. It's got a lot of cool Ukraine stuff, but it's supposed to be, again, take it to the beach, take it to the lake. It's a yeah. edge of your seat, white knuckle thriller. That's that's the goal. All right. This takes us to rapid fire, which is going to be a lot of your book stuff. And so um, uh, my, well, we'll just invert it, actually. Let's do your book stuff first, and then, uh, and then I have a couple right. other uh, political rapid fires at the end. Um, if you, for people that do want to just pop right back in to a Brad Thor book somewhere in the series, what I was curious of is, which one are you the most proud of? Which one do you look back and think, man, I really nailed it that time? Uh, well, I, I, it's like, which is your favorite child? You know, I've done all I my I only have one, so it's an easy used. question for it's me. It's an easy but I question you. for you. JVL um, also names one of his child's the favorite, so maybe not the best analogy is it for Flash? this podcast. Is that his favorite? Because he talks about Flash all the time, so I wouldn't no, be surprised. No, it's not Flash. It's not Flash. Oh, wow. Okay. Sorry, Flash. Uh, You're number two. <laughs> So, you know what? I try to do, I had a reviewer say that what Brad Thor does every year is he scales Everest, but a different face of Everest. Mm -hmm. So it's different technical climb every year. So every book I'm excited about, and I, I love them all. I actually cannot pick a favorite out of oh, all come of them. Oh, each one, I, I, I can't. I haven't said a favorite then, just one that you like, that you're like, uh, uh, speaking of the most uh, controversial, no, 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 no. Where you, where you just, you felt like that you were clicking on the writing side of things, right? Like, cause that's, you know, I, I, cause I already, okay. right? Like, look back, <laughs> and I can just speak for myself. Like, I look back, it's eighteen months now at at the at my book, and I and I'm like, man, I wish I would have done this different or that different. And I feel like if I had written twenty two, that at some point in the twenty two, I'd look back at one of them and think, you know, I really, I really kind of feel good about my writing in that one. Maybe it's not my, you know, maybe it's not my favorite well, story, I, but that on the writing side, I, I, I did it well. I'll tell you, a couple of years ago, I did a book called Backlash, okay, and it was unbelievably hard. Scott Harvath gets grabbed by the Russians. They are actually going to render him to their own version of a black site in Russia, yeah. and the plane goes down in Siberia. And I had to write a book about a guy trying to escape the Russians. And there wasn't a team for him to talk to and all this kind of stuff. And I really, really uh, stretched myself as a writer in that book. And I was yeah. really afraid that the marketplace wasn't going to like it. And it was one of my most popular books ever. That's cool. What about so, other- um, Took a lot of risk. You know, since you, you know, kind of are in this oeuvre, um, what, what's another contemporary that you think is really just nailing it? I always like to ask people for other for advice, uh, recommendations of other Another other contemporary who's- just nailing it. I there's there's a lot of guys. It could be television uh, writing too, even if you'd prefer that. To, or... No, I mean, it, 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 you know, it's funny because I take a lot of inspiration from television writing too. Yeah. Like I'm a big Ray Donovan fan. Oh yeah. Uh, I, it's just very very well done. Of course, Billions and Succession are also yeah. excellent. I was a big West Wing fan because of the dialogue. I thought it was very snappy yeah. and and well written. Yeah. And I've always been a Mammoth fan. So my fav one of my favorite movies is Ronin. And uh, oh, Mamet yeah. came in to do the rewrite on Ronan, and it's just so good. Uh, so, but I, there's so many of my contemporaries that are that are crushing it today. Whether it's Jack Carr, uh, I've always been a big Steve Barry and James Rollins fan, although they're not kind of in the same space that I'm in. Uh, they're a different kind of thriller, but kind of in that military espionage realm. I, I do like Jack Carr a lot, and he had a lot of success on Amazon Prime with his. Uh, with his show that uh, it became a real cultural badge of honor to support that show. Mm -hmm. I thought he rode that wave very, uh, very well. Uh, <laughs> you know, there are a lot of people in Hollywood that didn't like it, but it's done very well with other people in the country. And I'm, I'm okay with, you know, product doesn't have to be for everybody, but I think there's a certain part of the country that's been ignored for a long, long time by Hollywood. So now something does well out of Hollywood that plays right of center. I think that's good. I think there's plenty of space in the sandbox for everybody to play. Sure. What, um, uh, so you do, you're kind of trying to look ahead, um, at potential threats. 
So what what's one potential threat national security wise you don't think people are talking about enough when you sort of look out there? Well, I keep coming back to social media because I do think that's yeah. where we are. I, I think at this point we are our own worst enemy in in many senses. I think uh, we are doing in some cases irreparable harm to ourselves, to our, our fellow countrymen and women. I don't want to see another 9-11 have to happen to bring us all back together again mm-hmm. and remind us uh, that we have more in common uh, than, than we are different uh, in as Americans. So that's, you know, I look at the uh, Chinese are, you know, the Chinese are pretty scary. The Russians less so. We've seen the Russians, yeah. uh, the Iranians always have a, a potential to be a problem. I'm stunned by kind of how Islamic terrorism is just kind of you know, I hate to say it yeah. because tomorrow something could happen, but we don't it, yeah. we don't normally walk out worried about, you know, is somebody leaving a backpack at a cafe. That that stuff is just and I don't know how to explain it. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, so I'm I'm more worried about what's happening in uh, in the interior of the country, uh, us kind of citizen against citizen. Uh, January 6th is one of the most terrifying things. I've yeah. ever seen in my lifetime. Uh, so those of us who are never Trumpers, uh, who came from a conservative background, uh, I think have done, uh, you know, a particular amount of self uh, searching sometimes. You know, I always look back and think, man, if Donald Trump, you know, if, if Donald Trump's election to the presidency changed nothing for you, then I, I'm like, I don't know, we can't really connect. Because <laughs> like, yeah. if, if, it, if it, at least it, if it didn't make you kind of reflect about the state of you know, the movement, but also the country and the democracy. So anyway, I'm just I'm always curious for Never Trumps, for you, was there anything that in particular that you've kind of changed your mind on or looked back on and, and had a different different vantage point now than maybe you did in 2015? So this is this is something that's weird, and I don't know if our, our, our left of center audience is going to fully appreciate this, uh, but I, I, I'd, I'd make no I'd make no bones about the fact that I was a big gun guy. I was a big gun guy. I love to shoot guns, you know, yeah. I, I'm from a military family. Um, and, and so I always liked them and I liked to buy guns and I had a lot of guns. And then I watched those assholes show up at the Capitals, uh, particularly in Michigan, walking yeah. around with their long guns and stuff like that. And I realized that guns had been so fetishized. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, that's it. And I sold off a ton. It, it, suddenly the appeal in my my enjoyment of You sold that your own guns. Of, I sold my own guns. I had a lot of guns and I said, this is ridiculous. And I was embarrassed uh, by what I saw at those capitals, that intimidation of lawmakers by bringing firearms like that. But I don't care that you're allowed to do it. You know, there's a lot of things we're allowed to do, but is it the right thing to do? Is that really how you want to argue your point is is menacing with firearms like that? So yeah, I got rid of, I didn't get rid of all of them. Didn't get rid of all of them. I still got some and I love them. But I, I, I was just like, I had gone overboard with how many I had and that just, it just ended. Yeah, it for the me. culture around yeah. it just feels unhealthy. Uh, like at some point, yeah. just I, like, I, 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 I no longer enjoy it as much as I did. Um, yeah, I, that one was similar for me. It's funny because guns has nothing to do with Donald Trump, but it, it does in the way of sometimes you know in any group, right? You get caught up in um, oh, if that group is part of your identity, you know, there's certain things, certain elements that you have strong associations with. You know, like for you, you mm-hmm. mentioned earlier, like I feel very strongly about smaller government or whatever, more freedom, right? And then there are other things you have kind of weaker associations with that you're like, okay, well, this is my team's for this, so I'll just, you know, I'm going to add that to the list of things that I'm for. And that's really where I was on guns, right? I never was somebody that bought a lot of them, but it was kind of like, well, you know, that's part of the checklist. And I and and so it was really even before Trump, it was really Newtown for me that I was like, I, this is yeah. this is crazy. Uh, I, I need to change my my thinking about all of this. Um, okay, final final rapid fire question. Um, you know, I know that fiction writers don't always like suggestions from other people, but might there be a potential book where Jack Harvath gets assigned to, I don't know, you know, go undercover at a decaying uh, cl- uh, country club for rich people, maybe somewhere in South Florida, and, you know, do the one thing that the country needs, which is kind of take out a, you know, potential threat from the inside you know, who might want to lead the country again in the future. Might, the, might, might, like might, a, that, might a plot somewhere along those lines be interesting for this, Jack Harvath. This is, why, this is why specifically I do not take ideas from the outside. <laughs> I do not take ideas. 
no, no, no. That is okay. not on my uh, not on my list of potentials. All right. Well, I'm anyway. looking to keep my audience. I'm not looking to shed audience. I'm looking to build audience. I don't know in what you're talking anybody about. Simon and Schuster's watching the podcast. I'm a builder. Yeah. I'm okay. Not a I don't. I don't know what you're talking. Why that would have, uh, turn anybody <laughs> off? Okay. Brad Thor, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate you for uh, for you know supporting the bulwark and 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 what and listening Aww. to us. Feel free always to chime in if we if we're getting something right or wrong. And um, uh, Godspeed on on your work. Oh, actually, one more thing before we say goodbye. I I heard on another podcast that you said that you had a dream group that was going to get normies into primaries. Yes. And, and and literally, me and Sarah Longwell did that group in 2019, 2020. Oh, it was did called you? Center Action Now. It was on the Democratic side. It was under the radar. But the whole point was to get centrists to go vote in the Democratic primary. This was when there was concerns about Bernie. And we didn't yeah. tell people who to vote for. We didn't. We didn't. Yep. weren't like putting our finger on the scale for anybody. But it was just like, it was like, hey, if you are a suburban mom or dad that is, you know, kind of non-political, go, vote go out and vote. Like, yeah, Anybody register. You want? Yeah, pick whoever you want and, and try to push people in. I think that's such a great idea. And so maybe. Do you remember the title? Uh, the, I, would, I said it should be called Primary Responsibility. That's, that's good. That's what the group would be called. Anyway, I'm saying so we have a dormant group out there. So if you if you ever Reminded. get writer's block and decide okay. you want to get into the political world, you call me and Sarah, Okay. I will. Be my pleasure. Thank you so much for doing this. Enjoy Gay Perry, and uh, we'll see everybody on Wednesday for the normal, standard, regular, next-level debauchery with me and JVL and Sarah. Peace out.